Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to another YouTube video. In this one, I actually wanted to talk about some biblical principles that I've applied to my business that have allowed me to succeed at such a young age. Uh, and some of the things that I feel like, you know, I've been sort of force taught uh, throughout the process of growing my business uh, that, you know, I just keep getting reminded of and being pointed back to scripture and pointed back to uh, what the Bible has to say about, you know, how to conduct yourself. Uh, so for those of you who aren't Christian or who don't even necessarily believe in the Bible, this is still going to be a valuable video because it's going to be some very base core principles that I've used to make hard decisions and to, uh, you know, grow my business, um, you know, despite, you know, what some mentors may say and even despite, you know, what my own intuition might say. Uh, so let's just get straight into it. These are a handful of biblical principles or ideas that have helped me grow my business. So the first one, and this one is actually pretty fundamental towards my worldview, um, and it's a couple different, there's only a couple different ideas off of this one, but for those of you who are already Christian, you may be familiar with the parable of the talents, right? If you're not Christian, it's essentially this parable of a wise king that gave his servants a handful of gold coins. Uh, he gave one, one coin, and then, you know, going up the list, gave more and more and more coins to the different men. And the one who had the most coins went out into the market and duplicated those coins, brought them back to the master, and the master congratulated him. The one with the least amount of coins went and buried it to protect it and uh, didn't do anything with it. And then the master was actually displeased with behavior. So, um, you know, not just for me, but if you actually dig into this parable, you can actually find in Matthew 25, it talks about, you know, obviously the king giving his servants uh, a set of coins. The meaning behind that is actually pretty fundamental to why I believe, you know, I've been called to entrepreneurship and called to the marketplace. Uh, and that's because, you know, you're given at the beginning of your life a certain amount of assets, right? So you come out your mother's womb with a certain amount of time and attitude and the ability to produce or consume. And um, it is my belief that we are called to be producers more than we are consumers, or at least balance the two forces in a very um, reasonable way. There's also uh, the lesson in the parable of the talents about, you know, using your um, assets and using your gifts for good and multiplying them and actually putting them to work so that they expand. And this literally relates back to a bank account. I think a lot of uh, the modern church is kind of scared to relate this directly back to money because we're kind of concerned about, you know, prosperity gospel and we're concerned about, you know, oh, well, Christ doesn't come just to make us rich. And I agree with all of that. But at the end of the day, we've been given a certain amount of time and tools and resources, and it's our job to multiply them. And I believe it's an honorable pursuit and even a biblical pursuit to multiply our bank accounts, multiply our net worth and grow in that arena, not just in that arena, but in that arena uh, so that we can then give or we can give down to our family or our children or we can bless you know those around us or we can just be more stable on our own. I don't necessarily think that it's just about you know um, giving or whatever. I think it's also an honorable thing to be stable so that you can then you know do greater things. So Parable of the Talents is the first one. It's an obvious one. If you're a Christian, you've heard it a million times, but I think I grew up literally hearing, instead of talents, I heard talents, like playing the guitar or piano or being able to public speak or something like that. And for some reason, my pastor would say like, yeah, like it's all about using your talents. If you use your talents, you'll get more talents. And I, and I just felt like, I'm like, how does that work? Like that can't be it. And then I dug deeper and deeper. And it turns out like, that's just the modern church's way of trying to skew the message. Um, and I believe that the parable of talents truly is about, you know, us being gifted a certain amount of assets when we're born into the world, maybe the family you're born into, or maybe the amount of time you have or whatever it is, you've got that asset and it's your job to multiply it and grow it as if you would grow, say like a garden, right? Like a garden where you just replant the same amount of plants that you planted the year before isn't a growing garden. That's actually a very stagnant garden. And there's no such thing as stagnancy. You're either growing or you're shrinking, just like your business, you're either growing or you're shrinking. There's no stagnancy in your business. It's, it's one way or the other. So that's the first sort of parable or there's a ton of principles to come off that parable. Really, it's funny. I started this video saying I would share some principles, but I feel like that's more of a parable and there's tons of principles that drip down from that. It's interesting too that, um, you know, when the servant who is given the most gold coins goes out and multiplies them, brings them back to the master, the master says, quote, well done, good and faithful servant. And that line is only used a few times in the scripture. I, I believe only like two or three times. And that's for when, you know, God himself is, you know, favoring 
the behavior of you know man and that's when he says you know well done good and faithful servant so it's a very rare thing to hear and so it's interesting to me that the church has taken making money or duplicating your net worth and made it kind of demonized when in reality you know there's a lot of scripture backing the pursuit of growing a business or you know growing your craft or whatever it may be so uh, i digress that is one of the first things that i want to bring up in this video because you know when i got started I'll tell you a story about myself. I started off as a wedding photographer, right? Or actually before that even, I started off as a graphic designer. So my whole life, I've kind of just been taking my skills and turning them into revenue. And I've just kind of gotten into that habit, right? And I've gotten into that place where it's just what I do. I just find ways to sell my services or sell something and make money doing it. And it's just something that was definitely instilled into me by, you know, good parental structure growing up and a good family that really encouraged it in me. But at the same time, it just felt like fundamental to who I am. It didn't feel like it was ever you know, like forced into me. It just felt like that's what I needed to do was, you know, duplicate my talents, right? And I never really knew where that was coming from. And it's interesting to read this, you know, parable with a new lens, not about talents like guitar or piano, but actually talents like pieces of gold and realizing that this is just an innate human desire built into us by God to take what we're doing and grow it and multiply it. So, um, you know, I started off as a graphic designer, went into wedding photography, lost my gear in a house fire, uh, reset completely, started doing marketing for wedding photographers, got into marketing, and now, you know, we do what we do, and it's just kind of spiraled into where we are now, where we help, you know, coaches, consultants, agency owners, people with like a digital service. Um, market that service and sell more of it online um, so yeah it's a lot of fun that's the first thing that I wanted to bring up in this video so the next thing that I wanted to bring up in this video is actually a um, base like Judeo or more, more like Jewish uh, translation of what the story of Noah's Ark means um, it's interesting you know when you study Noah's Ark it seems like it's basically just the story of God punishing the earth and flooding it and just getting rid of all the humans. And that is that is a part of what happened, right? He chose Noah to, you know, continue the human race because Noah was one of the few remaining people that, you know, had his head tied on straight on his shoulders and wasn't, you know, out doing orgies or who knows what, right? Like the human race when it was first getting started was pretty broken and had a lot like of, you know, sin and lack of clarity and lack of direction and uh, weren't productive. They weren't multiplying, right? They weren't using their God-given gifts. They weren't using their talons and multiplying them. Uh, they were just kind of going out and just enjoying their bodies and doing, you know, stupid stuff. And so God resets the earth, puts Noah on the ark. And, you know, the story supposedly is just God resetting the earth. But uh, one of the translations that I learned from one of my mentors, who's a rabbi, talked about how Noah's ark is actually a more deeper threaded uh, sort of message, particularly for men in regards to storing up um, a, a safe house and building a moat around their livelihood in the event of a cultural collapse. So, you know, if you look at culture right now, it's pretty hard to argue if, you, if you're paying attention uh, that, you know, our culture is in a state of pretty intense decline. Uh, you know, we're skewing the lines between genders. We're skewing, you know, what it, we're, we're, we're creating a huge divide, a class divide between the rich and the poor. We're, we're destroying the middle class. We are, you know, dividing people into political views. We're dividing people into racial, you know, boxes. We're basically taking everybody, we're dividing them, and then we're f making them fight against each other. And, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what's happening. And we're, we're losing a lot of our core base values that have allowed, you know, the world to function, at least the Western world to function as well as it has for so long. And so what Noah's Ark really means is, is, is it's a call on men who see what's about to come in the future to be ready for that. Um, so if you look at Noah's Ark, it wasn't like, you know, a couple weeks out that the guy started building a boat. It was a long, long, long time. If I, if I remember correctly, it was like, how long was Noah building the ark? Let me just Google this real quick. It was like, it says 55 to 75 years that Noah was working on the ark according to the story, right? And so it's interesting, you know, Noah is attuned to God's voice. And in scripture, God kind of represents truth um, and, you know, kind of an almighty knowing of all things. 
And in that essence of knowing all things and knowing truth, he hears from truth just by keeping his ears open and having no ego, no pride, no, no prejudice, just trying to listen that something's coming down the pipe and you need to get ready for it. And I believe that as men today, we can all sort of see if, if your head is on straight that something is coming down the pipe. You know, our, our country, especially the United States and maybe the UK in some cases, they are kind of skewing. There's, there's some weird stuff going on the way that COVID's being handled. You know, a lot of my views are pretty politically incorrect when it comes to these things, but I'm not really worried about that. Um, and so you can see that we're kind of headed to a, towards a state of more author authoritarian rule. And, you know, that's the default state of man. I don't think we're really making that known to our culture that freedom is actually quite fickle. And if we don't take care of it, then we're going to lose it. Um, and so for me, I feel the same call on my life in my own interpretation to build my boat in the same way that Noah was called to build his boat and get ready for that cultural collapse. And I believe my boat is, you know, in the field of finances and wealth and power so that I can use that for my future family. I'd like to have four or five million net worth, uh, you know, in liquidatable assets and things that I can, you know, hold aside for my family by the time I'm at least 20 you know, seven, 28 years old, and just a really stable, steady net worth that no matter what happens, I've got this thing that I can rely on. And it's just value that of a human's value so that I can control, you know, my environment better and not be subject to, you know, whatever the government or whatever, whoever is going to try and take over, you know, it, it's, it might sound a little conspiracy theorist, but that's another principle that I take from the Bible is that as men, we are called to quote, build our boat. Um, and to really be ready for the storm, be ready for the cultural collapse. Uh, and you can actually Google Rabbi Daniel Lappin. He's got a podcast and he talks about the concept of Noah's Ark and what it means uh, in today's culture and how, you know, it's less about, um, you know, God punishing the planet, but it's more about, you know, the humans brought this on themselves ultimately, right? The people brought this on themselves because of their behavior, because God is a very neutral God. He's just he has no bias it's just he just is truth there's no emotion it's just look i set the standard i said if you keep behaving this way this will happen and then it happened just like you know in culture right now we're behaving a certain way and we're letting the state take enough power we are you know kind of behaving weird and something's going to bust at some point right um and so i i see it as my duty to be ready for that and what's nice is right now i'm just one guy i'm not married yet i've got a girl that i'm planning on marrying but I don't have any kids, nothing like that. And so I'm really just building my business for the sake of my own power and my own growth and uh, to bring a service to you know my fellow man uh, just so that I can be ready for that time. So that's another idea. I, I think you know Noah's Ark is often overlooked and there's not a lot of you know underlying meaning for a lot of people. It's just like, oh, God got mad and he reset the earth. But it's there's a deeper idea to it in that you know God represents the natural result of our actions right so just like if you were to punch somebody odds are you're going to start a fight just like if you're not going to behave well as a culture odds are you're going to you know create some lashback from the rest of the world or you're going to create even in quotes punishment from god in the form of you know uh raised taxes in the form of you know authoritarian government rule who knows what it is right so if we submit our freedom to uh, other men they're gonna they're gonna take it and so yeah, it's just another theme that I think is really important for myself, particularly at this stage in my life. It's that, you know, Noah's Ark doesn't just represent building a boat and escaping a flood. It's actually spending, you know, 55 to 75 years getting ready for that cultural collapse. So uh, just a fascinating, you know, interpretation and I believe a very true interpretation of the meaning behind the concept of Noah's Ark. So I could go for a while. There's a lot of little things that I've picked up in, you know, some mentors of mine that have shared with me or just reading scripture or spending time listening to podcasts or whatever on the topic. But the, you know, one of the last things that I'll bring up, maybe the last thing, I'm not really sure. I'm just kind of recording this video very naturally as I kind of go along and think about it, is this word, avodah, A-V-O-D-A-H, and uh, it basically is a Hebrew word for, you know, what we in English would use three words for, the word work, worship, and service. Um, so we, in th English, we have work, worship, and service, but in Hebrew, which is the initial language of mankind, uh, as well as the Old Testament 
original language, you know, there's one word for that, it's avodah. And so there's this concept that, you know, whenever you are working or whenever you are serving others or whenever you are worshiping, those are all the same thing. So by working, by serving others and by, you know, duplicating your talents, by preparing for the future, like we learned with the Noah's Ark concept, you know, we are worshiping God. And worship is this kind of skewed concept in our culture where we think it's all about, you know, praise, like, you know, music on a Sunday, or it's about, you know, strange cult-like rituals of worship or sacrifices. And those things may be true in some contexts, but I think one of my favorite quotes is that, you know, man fully alive is god's glory fully alive and man fully alive is man in work it's man producing and creating and being their own version of god here on earth being a mirror image of him in our own way creating our own environment and kind of crafting our own reality and using our own free will to do so so uh, avoda this word has a very fundamental meaning to my life in that you know i see my work and i see what i do and I see the effort that I extend in my day-to-day -day life, you know, these eight to 10 hour days or these back-to-back -back sales calls or, you know, working on our program, getting our clients better results. I see it all as a form of worship at the end of the day. Um, and I see it as a way of developing and, you know, working on my relationship with my creator in a very practical and pragmatic day-to-day -day way. Uh, I think it's interesting when people try and separate their work from their, you know, relationship with God or from their faith. And I think that's a really unhealthy thing to do because really at the end of the day, you know, God owns all of it and it's all his. And when you die, it's all going to go back to him um, in the form of going back to the people around you, right? So avodah is, is this really fundamental word. Like, for example, um, you know, if you've read Genesis, you read the Old Testament, you know, God places Adam and Eve in the garden to work the garden, right? Like to basically take this garden I've given you and multiply it, grow it, take care of it, and, and kind of subdue the earth with your own creation. And uh, avodah would be in replacement of that word uh, work. So God would say, all right, Adam and Eve, I'm placing you in this garden to avodah, which means work, which is also a form of worship toward me, towards me and serve one another in your work. So take care of each other, take care of the garden, and by doing so, you are worshiping me because that is my design for you is to be actively um, in that state of service and work. And I think it's a beautiful concept because I think it's easy, especially having grown up in the church, to separate, you know, what you do in your business from your faith. And I think that's incredibly unhealthy for a lot of Christians, especially when you're starting to earn a lot of money and you're trying to figure out, like, what role does that play in my work? And is that okay? And, you know, these are some of the things that I had to uh, work on when I was first getting started in business. I was starting to make, like, like I had, a you know, my first $10,000 day, and I was just like, all right, like, you know, is this okay? Am I allowed to do this? Like, is this, am I breaking some sort of a law here? And uh, no, I'm not. I, I believe I'm duplicating my talents and that I'll be rewarded ultimately for the duplication, the duplication of my talents not even to say that money is the only representation of talents. Maybe your talents are, you know, your relationships. Maybe your talents are, you know, some sort of a skill that you're developing. Or it could be, you know, a ministry you're working on, an organization. Or it can even just be your relationship with your kids or your family. Who knows what it is, right? Your job is to duplicate those things, work, and serve others. And in that, you are living out that concept of avodah in your day-to-day -day life. And I may be getting some of these things wrong, by the way. I'm by no means a scholar in these uh, issues or on these topics because for me this is purely just stuff that I've picked up along the way from you know uh, my father from mentors of mine like Rabbi Lapin from books that I've read from uh, other peers of mine that I've spoken to on these topics from you know other business owners that I know are Christian and so there's just a lot of little mixed ideas that have helped me craft my worldview and helped me design you know this fundamental Trey Cockrum, who is this guy, what does he believe, and how is he going to enact those beliefs into his world, and I will be first to say that I'm not a perfect Christian, like I'm far from uh, actually really living out these concepts perfectly, but these are some extremely useful ideas for business owners in the modern age, and I believe there's actually a lot of extreme 
like deep wisdom found in scripture and it's unfortunately been written off because you know it's a book that is really old or it's a book that you know was written a long time ago which brings me kind of to one of my other points and that's uh the actual meaning behind the jewish star of david and even though i'm christian right uh there's a lot of uh focus from jewish people on the old testament uh, because, you know, the Jewish people don't believe that Christ came, so they don't believe the New Testament has actually been written yet. They believe it's all just, you know, fluff. And so they're, they're looking at the Old Testament, and they've been studying it far more intensely than, you know, Christians, especially modern Christians, have been studying the Old Testament. We tend to write a lot of that off because we're like, oh, Christ came, wrote the new law, the New Testament is actually, you know, truth. But there's a lot of wisdom to be found still in the Old Testament. And one of the one of the things that is really interesting to me is, is is the meaning behind the Jewish star of David. So you've got the two triangles, right? And maybe Robert, my editor, can put up, you know, the Jewish stars. You've got two triangles, one facing up and one facing down. Let me just make sure I'm getting this proper here. Jewish star symbol. Yeah, so you got two you got two triangles. One facing up, one facing down. Um and supposedly what I've what I've from my understanding this actually has some incredibly deep meaning behind, uh, you know, the development of culture and economies and the way that human nature uh, sort of enacts itself in the world. So the upright triangle represents, and I could be getting this backwards, maybe the down and the up are being mixed in my head, but the upward triangle represents the three forms of wisdom, or the three things that never change, essentially. So you've got uh, God and his nature. So, you know, God is an ever-present constant, just like truth is an ever-present constant and never changes, just like cause and effect is an ever-present constant and never changes. God himself is an ever-present constant that never changes. His, his nature stays exactly how it is will always be that way and always has been that way. Then you've got on the bottom left, I believe that represents uh, basically the physical laws that govern our realities. So things like the law of gravity or, you know, the tide will always exist or the ways that matter behaves or the way that light behaves or the way that time functions, theory of relativity. These, these concepts, you know, they've always been and always will be. And there's nothing we can do as man to change those things, right? So those are the laws that govern our reality. And then on the bottom right, if I'm correct, that is essentially human nature and how humans behave. So on the bottom right of the star, uh, the bottom right of the upward facing triangle, that is human nature. So we have this idea in modern culture that like the further back you go, you know, it, with humans, the dumber they get. It's almost like, you know, oh, humans in the 1500s aren't as smart as humans in the 2000s because now we know more. And uh, that's that's just historically not true at all. There's there's all kinds of evidence of incredible technologies and incredible advancements, you know, even in the 1500s that you know rival some of our advancements today. But the issue is they just weren't able to communicate. So it wasn't until you know the 1900s when the printing press was invented that we can mass communicate concepts and now we can spread messages extremely quickly so that humans can start to band together and share ideas and share concepts more rapidly than the invention of the telephone, radio, the internet. Now, now we're on an extreme upward climb, but we're not necessarily more intelligent. Human nature has always been the same, and we, we never really changed that much. IQ doesn't have that much to do with it at the end of the day. It's, it's all about collaboration, and humans are extremely collaborative creatures and social in nature, and that has never changed. So there's a lot of base human nature ideas that have never changed and will never change. And the reason why that's important, and that's an, an important thing to understand, and we'll get to the, you know, the triangle that faces down here in a sec, is that it's important to understand, especially as a business owner, that humans have never changed, and that the problems that you're running into as a business owner, some other business owner has run into at some point, so you can seek wisdom from them, get their help and their guidance, and actually succeed over the long term in a far better way. And it's, it's very easy to think that the issues that you're facing as a business owner, nobody else has faced before, and it's easy to isolate or never solve your problems because you know you think that you know you're the only one but in reality what you're going through more than likely hundreds of thousands of other people have gone through the exact same thing and have dealt with it in their own way so you can find a very calming sense of community and a, a very reassuring sense of ability to solve your problems understanding that humans have never changed and just studying history in the way that you know businesses even in the 1800s 1700s you know behaved and what they did to you know grow their their influence it's it's really no different than the internet marketing sphere right there's the rules haven't changed really at all it's all the same rules it's just there's more speed at which we can transact and communicate and sell and build relationships right 
Um, so now for the two bottom, uh, the, the triangle is facing down, the three concepts there. So I could be butchering this, and I just I just Googled it to make sure that I'm getting it right, but there's not a lot of references to this, and so I'm not even necessarily sure where I heard this. Maybe you guys can do your own research and you can sort of come to your own conclusions, but I know for a fact that the upward-facing triangle, that's what it represents, but the downward-facing triangle represents the forms of wisdom or knowledge that are changing and that do actually adjust over time. Um, and I believe these are like things like technology, medicine, science, um, or like, you know, social norms and things that do adjust. So there's things that never adjust and there's things that constantly adjust over time and over, you know, human interaction and feedback and, and creation of new technologies or ideas. So there's fundamental base rooted principles that never change that we can build off of. And there's things that are always changing that we can learn from and apply to our modern day. So for example, and a very practical example of this in my life and a story that I could tell to explain this is, you know, I've studied a lot of classic business owners, like people, you know, that were ran businesses in the early 1900s. And for example, like David Ogilvy, he's one of the original copywriters who sold marketing services to like Ford Motors in the 40s and 50s, right? maybe more like the 60s and um you know his business model is extremely similar to our business model today where we're selling you know consulting and coaching on you know how to grow people's business there's like there's a lot of similarities and so just because we're using the internet to communicate more rapidly doesn't change the interconnections between the parts so there's fundamental ways that businesses have always been run and just because the internet has you know come around and, and is a new like sort of addition to the pile of variables that make or break your business doesn't necessarily mean that the rules have changed. It just means that we can communicate faster. So, you know, the downward facing triangles, the things that are always changing, technology, medicine, science, culture, the things that are facing up are the things that never change. Human nature being one of them, God's nature and the nature of the world, physics and things of that nature. Um, and so we can apply new ideas or new technologies to ways that humans have never changed to have an extreme advantage in the marketplace. So, you know, you can find almost this, you can imagine a spectrum. I'm sure you guys know what I'm talking about, where there's people on the far end where they literally only do what has always worked. These are people that run like yellow pages ads. And these are people that, you know, have law firms that don't have a website yet or whatever, and they make some money. But then you have people on the other end where they're just chasing a pile of gold with the internet. They're setting up Shopify drop shipping stores, even though that, that model could work. They are doing like, you know, weird online money making schemes they're joining internet based mlms they're just you know kind of trying to leverage the internet as far as it'll take them to make as much money on the cusp and i believe as a business owner we should meet somewhere in the middle where we take you know what has always worked in the models that have always worked for you know what to sell how to sell it how to position it etc and we blend that with the internet which is a way of communicating much faster so we take human nature and its base principles of why people buy, what they want, why they want it, how quickly they want it, how to deliver it, et cetera. And we take the internet, which is this communication tool that is just like a megaphone for, you know, being able to create relationships and interact with people and, you know, do business with them. And we merge these two forces to create a business that will last generations and will grow at an extremely fast rate as compared to, you know, the old Yellow Pages guys. But there's some wisdom in those people that run the Yellow Pages ads because they have a model that works and they refuse to change it because they just want it to work. So you can learn from these guys and then apply what they're doing to the internet and have the best of both worlds. So anyway, that's just some ideas that I've learned from scripture and just my study of, you know, more religious, um, you know, worldviews. Uh, having grown up a Christian myself, I still am a Christian. And I'm constantly seeking new truths that I can apply to my life or my business through these ideas. So hopefully this was a valuable video for you. There's a lot more I can go into in this video. I'm sure I could have spent a couple hours going into just some of the, you know, deeply threaded like ideas uh, that have helped me, you know, just see the world more clearly and be able to operate more clean as a business owner and as a person ultimately. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of attempt number one at this video. I'm sure I'll make another one soon about some other ideas that have helped me. But if you have any takeaways from this video, be sure to leave a comment or shoot me a message or just, you know, share the video with a friend. Maybe this is a helpful idea or these are helpful ideas for your other peers in business. And, um, yeah, thanks so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed and I will see you all in the next one.